American religious leader garnered more attention during the 20th century than William Franklin Graham or Billy Graham. And as a result, no religious icon produced more controversy. His accomplishments included ministering to a number of US presidents, including Richard M. Nixon. Graham claimed he served as their spiritual advisor and remained above the political fray, but closer scrutiny reveals a different portrait, particularly as it relates to Nixon's career. In conversations and behind the scenes activities, Graham and Nixon coordinated political efforts on Nixon's behalf. In return, Graham received favors from the president in a quid pro quo between the two men. They shared a friendship, but also relished their power and used it to advance their careers. As Nixon once said to Graham, keep doing that sly thing you were doing. This coordination happened despite the fact Graham denied any political efforts to assist Nixon. Such subterfuge shines a light on Graham's image that reveals less than flattering information, at least for that period of time. While Graham insisted he acted as nothing more than a pastor to the politician, the historical record contains almost no hint of spiritual conversations between them. Their public protestations about friendship and religious counsel failed the test of history, which instead reveals a political operation propped up by a deceitful publicity campaign. This pattern of behavior was established long before Nixon became president. Nixon and Graham built the duplicity of their public versus private realities <clears throat> upon a well-trodden path established from the beginning of their relationship. They became friends during the 1950s when Nixon served as vice president of the United States. They recognized the way each could assist the other in terms of access to power and in promoting one another in public. They seldom discussed faith, at least on the record that remains. Indeed, from their first meeting, a pattern emerged that would define their behavior going forward. They admired one another, both in private conversations and in public comments, worked fervently behind the scenes to bolster one another's standing, and exchanged favors based on their positions of power. They sold Americans on the spiritual nature of their relationship, yet scant evidence speaks to any faith conversations or consultations. For example, it was as vice president that Nixon began to attend Graham's crusades, always claiming his participation was strictly about faith, despite evidence that Nixon appeared at the events in a calculated political move to associate himself with the famous evangelist and the two men began to do favors for one another that foreshadowed their cooperation after Nixon became president, establishing the public duplicity of their relationship from the first. Despite Nixon maintaining a rule as vice president not to intervene on behalf of individuals and the relationship with the government, in December 1957, Graham requested that Nixon assist him with a tax problem. The then fledgling publication, Christianity Today, of which Graham was a founding member and which was edited, edited by his father-in-law, L. Nelson Bell, had petitioned for tax exempt status with the Internal Revenue Service. To assist Graham, Nixon asked the Treasury Department to expedite the matter, and he put in a good word on its behalf. Nixon further assisted Graham with his visits to foreign countries. He orchestrated meetings for Graham with world leaders, such as Nehru in India and Nasser in Egypt, as well as gaining Australian government aid in preparation for a Graham crusade there. In other words, Nixon agreed to do favors for Graham, establishing that Graham benefited from the friendship as much as Nixon did politically from his association with the evangelist. They shared the power they both possessed to ramp up their fame and public esteem. Nixon and Graham also plotted together regarding Nixon's 1960 campaign for president, revealing the long-term roots of the discrepancy between their public proclamations of simple friendship and spiritual advice versus their simultaneous backroom political dealings. Without publicly endorsing Nixon, Graham did everything possible to assist Nixon's 1960 run for president. To the point that years later, even the careful evangelist admitted that he had become too involved in private advising and politicking. He declared in public that he thought Nixon the most prepared person ever to be president, and later stated that he would vote based on deep personal convictions. 
This subtle approach belied the lengths they went to behind the scenes to coordinate their efforts. Graham and Nixon strategized on a regular basis, generally with Graham giving his take on the pulse of Americans regarding the campaign, and with Nixon using Graham as a barometer of public opinion. Graham's advice to the presidential candidate often urged Nixon to maintain his staunch cold warriorism and to continue courting Southerners for the Republican Party, despite anger in some Southern quarters over Eisenhower's order to end segregation. Graham felt that the Democratic Party also alienated Southerners, giving the vice president a chance to garner favor if he danced around the issue of the civil rights movement without backing one side or the other. While Graham charted a clear path in his career toward ending segregation, his 1960 political advice revealed a pragmatic approach when it benefited his friend. In personal letters to Nixon, Graham added regular recommendations on how to garner conservative religious votes by appealing to their sensibilities and causes without dwelling on anti-Catholicism or divisive issues. Graham also celebrated Pat and Richard's 20th wedding anniversary at a crusade in Washington, DC, thus linking his religious revivals to the vice president. The same methodology of stating one thing in publicly, public while plotting politically in secret happened in 1968 when Billy Graham agreed to do behind the scenes work again. In a number of ways, Nixon attempted to covertly convince Lyndon B. Johnson, then president, to step away from the political scene, not endorse his vice president, Hubert H. Humphrey, and instead help Nixon win the election. Graham agreed to function in this capacity since he was also friends with Johnson, specifically during a September 15th meeting with the then president. Graham communicated pledges that Nixon made to Johnson to never embarrass him, praise him frequently, work with him in transition and send him on special assignments after the election. Nixon also promised through Graham to never point out weaknesses of Johnson's administration and to credit him too when Nixon brought about peace in Vietnam. Graham delivered the message and then promptly reported back to Nixon's campaign. Graham indicated that the gesture touched Johnson who had Graham read through the proposal twice then took Graham's notes and studied them. Johnson told Graham he would remain loyal to Humphrey but nonetheless would do all in my power to cooperate with Nixon if he wins the election. Graham had thus served as a campaign operative for Nixon. After the November election and victory by Nixon, H.R. Haldeman, Nixon's chief of staff, and Graham conferred about the role each had played in the win. Haldeman congratulated Graham saying, for in no small measure, you are responsible for Richard Nixon being our next president. He then asked Graham for further suggestions as the team moved forward. Graham had written that, I doubt the White House has ever had such efficient management as you will bring. I have watched with growing admiration your tremendous ability. As he did with Nixon, Graham greased the wheels with Haldeman to maintain his high level access and then passed along the names of three individuals he wanted considered for positions in the administration. Evidence again suggests that Graham's influence brought evangelicals into the Republican fold. Roy W. Guftison at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association team, in, team office in Atlanta cheered, our man made it this time. Whether direct or indirect, Graham was delivering votes for Nixon. The favors between the two men continued to go two ways once Nixon became president. Graham played an enormous role in the inauguration day festivities. In fact, Nixon wanted Graham to give all the prayers that day, but the evangelist convinced the next president to include more people so as to give the events an ecumenical flair. However, Graham dominated the religious nature of the proceedings, prompting scholars Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy to describe the events as the closest America ever comes to a national church service and Graham's prayer specifically as an evangelical call for the nation to come to Jesus for salvation. Graham and others prayed for Nixon and entreated God to grant his blessings upon the new president. The publicity machine benefited Graham this time around. After helping associate Nixon with the evangelists during the election, now Nixon gave Graham center stage during the national inaugural festivities 
and therefore increased his prestige with such personal counsel to a president. A notable arrangement once Nixon became president that uncovers how their previous patterns of behavior manifested in the White House comes through the establishment of religious services. Nixon initiated a new White House ritual of Sunday Christian services and quite predictably, Graham led the first one and appeared a variety of times thereafter. This cooperation solidified the public image of two friends working together toward faith programs, though Nixon's team saw them as primarily publicity enterprises. Graham also assisted with the services behind the scenes, in part by providing a list of preachers that he vouched were Nixon supporters to preside over them. The outward appearance of nonpartisan religious ceremonies gives way to covert and choreographed events meant to uplift the president's image and to block anyone from participating if they were politically neutral or Democrat. While Graham, and, while Graham, Nixon, and other White House officials maintained that the services provided nothing more than spiritual nurturing for, nurturing for those who attended, subsequent records reveal the administration at least combined this sense with political considerations. Charles Colson is admitted as much, and records demonstrate the same regarding the Graham White House relationship and planning them. In other words, the White House services became the hidden political operation between Graham and Nixon, using religion to gain constituents and maintain power. Privately, Graham also advised the president on a regular basis, claiming publicly to do so in a pastoral way, but really acting as a political consultant. Graham probably did pastoral counseling though no archival materials reveal as much, meaning that all of this spiritual care happened without ever being recorded or is hidden in unreleased recordings and filings. Graham himself later admitted to doubt about the depth of Nixon's faith practice based on what he observed and heard from the president throughout their friendship. Despite the fuzzy nature of the spiritual relationship, available, available materials do reveal how Graham operated regarding politics. His favor to the president came most clearly as a voice of common Americans, someone with a clear read on the public and how Nixon could best reach them. Graham often critiqued the president's speeches and public appearances for Nixon, always with effusive praise and occasional constructive criticism, but none with a spiritual element. His verbal and written comments boosted Nixon's morale and suggested how to cater his message to their shared constituents. Graham also sought and received favors in return. For example, Nixon intervened on behalf of Campus Crusade for Christ in order to get its members exempted from the draft as preachers with records indicating the White House took great pains to assist in this matter specifically because of the evangelist's request. Billy Graham continued to support publicly the president once Watergate became the dominant national story in the United States as his friendship with Nixon and unfettered access to the White House continued. Graham demonstrated a trait that he maintained throughout the ups and downs of Watergate. He refused to abandon his friend, regardless of what information became public or how much it led others to question Graham's own ministry. Of course, this devotion came with the privilege that Graham enjoyed because of his loyalty, a factor never easy to separate or distinguish from the more honorable one of commitment to a friend, which he maintained throughout. Yet signs of tension for Graham over the national crisis emerged. Because so many viewed him as a national moral compass and symbol among evangelicals and leading a righteous life, the ethical and moral bankruptcy that came to light in Washington, D.C. demanded the preacher's attention. Graham deflected any direct references to the president himself, but began to formulate what increasingly would become his message about Watergate as the embodiment of national sin. Their coy game was becoming more difficult to maintain, but they persisted with it nonetheless. The media savvy Graham fell into a common pattern when asked about Watergate by summer 1973. He always defended Nixon, assured people of the president's high moral character, and relayed his friend's determination to get to the bottom of Watergate. In that regard, he echoed the message coming from the White House and persisted as one of the administration's publicity agents. If Graham mentioned the crimes associated with the break-in, he placed in them in the broad context of human sin and reminded everyone of the importance of their own conversion and repentance. This too repeated a familiar Graham 
pattern it's in its theological solution to assist to a significant problem repent and god will save you and if enough americans repent god will save the nation at the same time graham dodged the issue of watergate as much as possible seeming to grow weary of the constant attention it garnered this sidestepping did not stop reporters from asking him about watergate Suddenly, Graham's famous relationship with one of the most powerful men in the world became more of a burden than what came with his previous access to power and their shared accolades. Graham's attempted business as usual clashed with the increasing government turmoil. A case in point happened during a news conference on August 23rd, 1973 in London, England. Graham relished his forays to the United Kingdom and enjoyed a good amount of success at his crusades there including positive media attention. When the press asked about Watergate, Graham answered with his familiar pattern and deflections. First, he refused to believe Nixon involved himself in the matter and then tried to divert attention to the broader problems facing the United States. He therefore was hoping that it will have a cleansing effect on the country. And I'm sure it will make the president himself more careful, more cautious in the aids he chooses and will deepen him morally and spiritually in his own personal life. Graham's comments distanced Nixon from the crime itself, relying on the administration's argument that a few rogue employees instigated the problem without the president's knowledge, and furthered the argument with the notion that the con controversy would strengthen Nixon by getting him to focus more on morality and spirituality. Though wishing to avoid Watergate during his overseas visit, he took the question in stride and applied his common response. As mentioned, and typical of Graham with any subject matter, he employed his lifelong theology to Watergate. Any controversy, public crisis, or problematic situation led the evangelist to call for prayer and repentance, hoping enough people turned to God to solve the problem. This tried and true answer allowed Graham to discuss Watergate without delving into his association with the administration or addressing Nixon specifically. He stated, the Bible says that all men are liars and we all have a little bit of Watergate inside of all of us. His comment trivialized the burglary into an everyday sin. Rather than an abuse of power or betrayal of public trust, Watergate lined up with the common failing of lying to which he hoped people would be forgiven. He warned listeners therefore to remember the words of Jesus, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. This comment admonished the press and others for continuing to criticize the president and others for Watergate, asserting a Christian should forgive and judge themselves instead of others. Graham's stripped down theology had thus, thus dismissed the ah, Graham's stripped down theology had thus dismissed the po biggest political scandal in American history, at least at that point, to a common sin. Graham hammered his point into the ground, demonstrating a, a resolve to stick to the message and protect his friend. He warned against anyone badgering the president about Watergate because the United States so epitomized sin that no one could escape God's wrath without repentance. He admonished almost anywhere you look in American life today, whether it's business or labor or government, you find corruption among certain people. There's a certain element in all of these areas of our life which, in which there is corruption. Graham implied that a country rife with immorality should expect as much from people at the top, including those in the administration involved in Watergate. Graham's spiritual advice to the nation maintained the method of warning people of their own faults, of asking them to address those first, and therefore leaving the Watergate matter alone, while the president, whom Graham trusted, sorted it out. In addition to tying Watergate into his tried and true knot of sin writ large, Graham copied the White House playbook in castigating the media and insinuating that everyone in politics engaged in such shenanigans. The media had, to, had begun to ramp up its questioning of Graham during this period because of his close association with Nixon and his image as America's pastor. Graham's public relations skills kicked in as he addressed Watergate without betraying his friend as any, and as he leaned into tropes he had employed throughout his career. By late 1973, and especially into 1974, Graham could not contact the president any longer. Nixon had isolated himself almost completely as he was mired in his attempts to conceal the Watergate crimes and save his administration. 
However, Graham never stopped his campaign to protect Nixon, even after the president's resignation. In that regard, Graham proved a true friend. It took several months after Nixon left office before the former president accepted a phone call from Graham, no doubt finally taking it because of Graham's unwavering public support and persistent private attempts to contact him. Graham often proclaimed after Watergate that he had learned a valuable lesson during the Nixon administration about getting too involved in politics and vowing to stay out thereafter. Yet even that assertion seems a little suspect because as late as 2012, he appeared in advertisements to urge Americans to vote based on their evangelical convictions in the next presidential election. While never explicitly an endorsement of the Republican candidate Mitt Romney, the association between key evangelical issues such as abortion and the conservative Republican party were obvious. Was Graham truly repentant about getting caught up in politics with Nixon or just better at the duplicity moving forward? Thank you.